No. No buzz. Let's get it. Uh, like three months ago, I read Good Night Sleep Tight by Brian Evanson. Uh, I was fine. Uh, I, my strongest memories of this book are that I said this to multiple people. That's true at the time. It remains true. Uh, my fondest memory of this book is reading it and being like, whew. I do have, uh, still some, uh, some critical thinking skills and, uh, and appreciation of good versus bad writing. Um, whatever. I mean, the, obviously the binary is, is the binary and like, fuck them. But I think I read this in the run where I was reading, like, I reread one, they're there, um, for a book club that then went into Wandering Star, so I read both of Tommy Orange's fucking banger novels. Uh, I think I was also in the middle of listening to Don't Fear the Reaper, um, and My Heart is a Chainsaw. I, I like re-listening to them again, and just be like, eating that shit up. Uh, not far away from Septology at that point. I think I might have also had just read Mystery and Manners by Flannery O'Connor. Like, they're all in the same little period um and i feel like james was right in there um but later but like i was in this moment where i was like do i have a sense of bad writing anymore because it seems impossible that i just read this many bangers in a row um in a year uh and like part of that is i was being a little pickier, right? I was, um, I was occasion. I was like hitting stuff that I was like, "This is good." Because I think I, I was reading like Renee Gladman's um, one of the Ravik books, uh, and I got like a third of the way through, two thirds of the way through, maybe. And I was like, "I'm just not clicking with this," and so I put it down. I wasn't like finishing stuff that I wasn't super clicking with, which is not usually how I go. I'm usually just like. Let's finish this thing and talk about it. Um, so finish this thing and I sort of talked about it with a book club, but uh, it was a very short one, and that was months ago. So I basically have no strong memories about "Good Night Sleep Tight" by Brian Evanson, but what I did do is write a one sentence summary of each story. So I'm gonna read those out loud and see uh, if that inspires any thoughts. And if not, that's fine. Um, the other thing I'm, I'm gonna say is uh, I'm actually really excited to read more of Evanson's stuff. Um, as much as I thought this was extremely mid, um, I've heard his name for years from like very reputable sources. I suspect there are other things he's written that work better for me. Um, so I'm not like writing him off as an author just because I thought he wrote a thirty fucking short story collection that didn't quite land. But uh, let's. Let's go, and I think. No, I got one more thing. Okay. First short story is called The Sequence. My description. Twins, Sidra and Celine, walk in a particular way away from their catatonic grandpa and into a gray world. Um, this one has kind of stuck with me more than I thought it would. I, I, I will say that. Um, it's, a, it's a good image. It's like, yeah, it's... Two twins, one more reluctant than the other, um, discover the steps for uh, entry into another dimension, parallel place that inhabited by something that may or may not be there. Um, this is like might be the one I remember most of all of them, which is like cool. Um, it's also where I remember being like, this is a really neat premise and it's not quite working, I think, because of like specific word choices. But that was like three word months ago. So I don't remember those word choices anymore. I bet they're still there though. Uh, story two, The Cabin. James Beckworth, high altitude, steps on a trap after, not really how I write usually for these things. Um, let me start over. James Beckworth, high altitude, steps on a trap after failing to cross a lake. Stranger tells him a story surrounded by stones. Um, another, this is like where you sort of get the sense that a 
good chunks of these are going to portal fantasies or portal horrors, um, which does, as I recall, uh, stay true for, for a while. Um, they're interspersed with a bunch of robot stories that I think my coworker and former occasional B um, had a better time with than I did most of the time. Um, but we'll get there when we get there. Um, so yeah, the, the, you know, liminal spaces, I guess, is the is the current term. Um, I'll get, well, maybe that's over at this point. Who knows? Um, yeah, as a guy who's really high up on a mountain uh, ends up in a cabin with a level entity, and uh, he, spoilers, he gets turned into a baby. I mean, I might have made that up. Uh, the river. A highway breakdown leads Reiter, R E I T E R, Reiter. Or, did I just did that. Uh, a highway breakdown leads Reiter to an uh to a to an unnameable town where a boy rides a man in a weird closet. Um, another one that has a couple of good images, like yeah, the opening image of the like constantly flowing highway and what to do with a breakdown and then ending up in town where there's a boy who's like always got his hand on this man's cheek very interesting concept of the game um you know most of these aren't these are mostly atmospheric horror sort of vibes they are you know, more in the ghost story tradition than say the uh, gore story tradition. um an unsettling thing happens in a place that is like our own, but not quite. Um, and, you know, I can eat those up when I find them to be well-written. Um, a true friend. But one brother paralyzes another, so he'll be buried alive. Um, this is a really short one. Um, this is one, I think this is the one, I think this is the one. I have a note here. Uh, first non-portal that's up uh that's up perspective fuckery so yeah again this is the worst one where it's like there's never a moment in which somebody passes through a thing to end up potentially somewhere else um because there's a, a hole in the fence along the highway that is in uh the river uh story that like you know one could easily read as the the wardrobe of of the lion and the witch thing. Um, it's it's fine, and I think yeah, I think it does a decent job of like putting you in the mode to get more out of what some of his later stories do with like yeah perspective. Because spoilers, um, as I recall, um, you. Get the first, you know, three quarters of the way through the story, and it sounds like you're reading from the perspective of somebody who has been betrayed, and then in the last, uh, you know, maybe it's like seven, eight, last eighth, uh, for eighth <laughs> division, um, last little bit, it's like, oh, it's not the, it's the betrayer, not the betrayed, who is making all these proclamations about what a true friend would be. Boom. Effective switched. Annex. An eternal robot reaches a point of inflection where, instead of compelling its next self, offers it a choice. Um, yeah, this is, I think, one of the first longer stories. It's the first robot story. Um, this one, I, I will say, also has some images that have stuck with me I think, better than a lot of the later ones. Um, it's, yeah, a... A robot is led by its master to a space where it is meant to go certain intervals. The master stays behind. The robot goes in, learns some stuff from uh, an entity, and then spoilers, it turns out that the, the robot has been the master the whole time. The robot, like, basically goes out and lives for a certain period, a certain length of time in the world comes back to reintegrate with itself, and in doing so, creates a new robot that will go out and pick a new master to sort of um, 
lead it back here when the time is right for it to reintegrate all of the stuff. Um, a, a cool, a pr fine premise. Um, I think this is also one of the ones where I was just like, I started being like, ooh, there's some diction happening. Just like little bits and pieces here and there where like certain descriptors would feel a little off or um, there'd be like elisions of like things that, sh that seemed important or there would be like weird extraneous descriptions, just, like little, you know, bits and bobs of things that are just like, the writing's not all there. Um, next we have untitled parentheses, cloud of blood. A man transfixed by an abstract painting writes his suicide note. Um, this is the most uh, just straight up, like, uh, M.R. James, uh, you know, Edith Nesbitt fucking, you know, the, it's missing the frame story of two men with cognac uh, telling this story or whatever, but, but like, it's also kind of, um, it's just a, it's just like a ghost story that is painting spooky and maybe it's killing people but maybe it isn't um oh i have a note here quotation i didn't realize i did that okay so let's let's see if m m i am just dismissing this in in a uh, retrospect or i uh let's see last thing i expected I have no idea where this is on the page, and that's uh, uh, not going to be interesting. Hmm. 57? This is... Okay, I found it. We'll see. Um, I guess I'll just read the context all. Uh, she, would, she would perhaps have been surprised to know that I had thought of her gallery, blah, blah, blah. So he sent this... Uh, dad is dead. The main character's dad is dead. He sent the painting off to a gallerist to sell. Um, and he doesn't want to just do the one because he thinks that might be suspicious, so he sends, like, all of the paint. Um, Galler's wife contacts him, um, and he's, like, internally, like, I don't care how the selling's been doing, I just want that fucking painting going. So, quoting, um, from, in the letter from the Galler's wife, I imagine you are curious as to how successfully the gallery has been your work, your paintings, she wrote. I was not, in fact, at all. You may be curious, too, as to why it is I, rather than my husband, who writes to you. Well, yes, admittedly, I was slightly curious about that, but only slightly. Had she herself not raised the issue, I would simply have assumed that her husband was a public face of the gallery, while she was the person behind the scenes who had the, booking, the bookkeeping and the issuance of checks. But despite this slight curiosity, the last thing I expected was for her to continue on in her letter to reveal to me that her husband was, in fact, suddenly, unexpectedly dead. And I think... I think that's not a particularly flattering sentence. I, what I, my note actually starts with, the last thing I expected was for her to continue on in her letter to reveal to me that her husband was, in fact, suddenly, unexpectedly. Um, it's just clunky. It's like clunky writing, I think. Like, it just doesn't read... It doesn't read naturalistic to me. It doesn't read stylized to me. Like, words down. Um, to convey something, and you didn't quite con um, So yeah, that to me is an example of just moments where 
the story kind of lose it, or one of the stories or, and many of the stories in this kind of lose its its voice um, next story the thickening Grepper's Grepper's childhood horror finds him alone after his wife's sudden passing yeah this is about a kid who when he's alone at night um, feels sort of a thickening of the air with something behind it um, then it disappears for like 60 years um, and he talks about how he's just never slept alone in that whole time his wife passes he's forgotten about the thickening it comes back it's a horse uh, mother Rolog learns the truth about mother and becomes one uh, another robot story I'm surprised I'm pulling these all pretty pretty decent I think um, about Rolog and there's another uh, another child and and robot mother and then there's father who's just a spaceship and it becomes pretty clear pretty early as I would recall that um that there was some sort of mission that they were on to populate this planet that it went bad maybe died and that um there's a question of how the roles were determined and that maybe that's uh, a little awkward and then there's uh, a horror you know, twist at the end which I already spoiled um yeah robot story it's fine good night sleep tight um the title story we are about halfway through I want to say damn Double mother tells scary stories after real mother has left the room. Um, you could go read Model Home by River Solomon. Vigil in the inner room. Dari holds vigil. Gilvy set, set, uh, seals, that's the word. Um, like with wax. Okay, vigil in the inner room. Gari holds vigil. Gilvy seals the door each time. Father dies. Gari gets up. Um, we're in the like high fantasy vein. Um, I guess we haven't really done an out and out portal fantasy since a true friend. That's interesting. I thought there were more of them. Um, I know, I know. There's at least one more coming up, but um, yeah, this is much more feels much more high fantasy, um, like blatant allegory kind of vibes. Uh, yeah, the father dies repeatedly um, and needs to have uh, someone to hold vigil in the room. That's the the main daughter. Now, someone to completely seal the door. Uh, that's the you know younger daughter, I believe. I don't remember actually the gender of these children. And then the, the wife watches the window, I want to say, and like cuts. Oh no, she holds a candle up and like lets it let like has to be comp completely still. And so she's like covered in wax scars on her, like a dominant arm. Um. um <laughs> I liked the story in Like Smoke Like Light that was a lot like this. I think the first story, better. I don't think either of these last two stories are, like, bad, at least not in my memory. And again, I think none of these are bad as such. I just think that so many of them had, like, weird awkwardnesses in the language that, like, none of them, like, stuck with me. But yeah, um, the other floor, in the moments before sleep... Doran sees a door. When he finally makes it through, he doesn't get to the other floor. Um, so yeah, portal fantasy. Uh, he, there's a there's a, a portal that appears in sort of the peripheral vision of of the nearly asleep. Um, that also has a sort of keeper. Uh, this kid follows the keeper through the door and does not heed the warning. He um, Orpheus like fails to heed the warning not to look back and gets trapped. I think this one, as I recall, this one also had, like, some of the more egregious moments where I was just, like, eh. <laughs> flinching at the language. 
Um, imagine a forest. Uh, Vetla grows up among the children on a starship and leaves a message to the six kids he saved. I think, as I recall, I think this is the best written of the lot. Um, I think this is one of the ones. So this is a this is a robot story, and uh, it's Vetla is like a robot caretaker who um, you learn at the end. Spoilers, as always that um, they are basically like the uploaded consciousness of the like captain's daughter, I want to say, or child of some sort. Um, they are uh, being brought along to help populate this world or whatever. And like, um, and the children are there because they're like too young to basically go into cryo sleep until they slowly age up. And then um, at some point, there's a you know an asteroid collision and the story is then revealed to be being told via basically like uh uh like a hologram a star wars ass hologram to the six survivors who were the only six who could be saved from the cryo sleep and it's explained to them that you know the reason they were the six was not because they were the most likely to survive as was like the task it was because they were the six kids that Vetla grew up with and that that sucks or whatever but it is what it is um it's I think that one's genuinely like the strongest from frame from the way it's framed to the way it's written again I might be mis misremembering some things to the like reveal at the end like I think it's just a pretty solid robot story maternity Anna's job at the maternity ward is hard but good. A woman with her name steals a baby. A decade later, she returns with her own. Um, I frankly have no thoughts about this. Um, like the only thing that even remotely stands out is that there's a moment when the other Anna who stole the baby like is like nearby and the Anna who's the nurse has a has a fleeting thought that like maybe she should steal the baby and just like sit in another room with it for an hour maybe she does this uh and make her see how it feels but the other Anna doesn't even notice because she's literally just given birth uh and is exhausted and like yeah uh this did nothing for me the night archer a sister tells her brother tales of a night archer to distract him of their mother's dying. When she goes, he invokes the tales. But maybe the father is the problem. Um, again, playing in the... Yeah, way less portal fantasy than I remember from this. <laughs> um, this is straight up, like, you know, um, kids taking myths too seriously and then them maybe becoming true. Um, and, like, the big thing is, like, the Night Archer, his, like, you offer it, like, shiny coins or whatever that you put in the fireplace at night, and then you, like, give it instructions, and it goes off to hunt, and, you know, it's a, it's a fairy tale, so maybe the hunt isn't quite what you expected it to be, and, uh, also their mom's rotting in the room next door the entire time or whatever. Or does it maybe just die near the end? Um... You know, whatever. Um, servitude. Rich people abandon Earth with a servant class and the robots beneath them. Rich people abandon Earth with a servant class and the robots beneath them. But was the revolution good, or did the robots love a story? Um, I was getting a little exasperated at this point, probably. Um, right, it's, uh, yes, the humans revolt against the, the super rich people who have taken them on their generation ship or, ship or whatever and kill them all and it's like a big thing of like the robots who are the servants of the previous servants are like yo is this a full revolution or are you just is this another bourgeois revolution a perfectly fine premise um go read you know Lee's the machineries of empire trilogy I didn't plan on any of these comps until I started doing them. Um, it does not do what you think it does. 
A cursed man who smells like a campfire hears the story of another cursed man who hears the story's title. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> um, that one got me. A cursed man who smells like a campfire hears the story of another cursed man who hears the story's title, which, of course, is it does not do what you think it does. It's like being repeated to him. Um, let's see, page 196. I have, I didn't, again, didn't realize I had another quotation here. Uh, this is a Twilight Zone episode. It's fine. Um, maybe Outer Worlds is probably actually more accurate. 196. does not do what you think it does. I sleep very little, but sometimes I'm so exhausted that I laugh from consciousness only to wake in a few minutes later with, with to whisperings of that same sentence. He shook his head. I don't know what to do, he said. What should I do? I looked at him for a long moment, then I removed my wallet and paid for my meal. I stood. Good night, I said. Sleep tight, and left for the dinner. Uh, Good night, I said. Sleep tight, and left for the diner. So we got, we got the title phrase drop, the, the story title. Not the story title. Well, we got the story title, we got the book title. Um, and then I guess at some point... I lifted my forearm to my face. It still impossibly smelled of smoke. No, it doesn't, I told myself. It does not smell like you think it does. Ooh, get it? It does not do what you think it does. It does not smell like you think it does. The context um, don't really support that parallel at all, and I don't think there's actually anything there. Uh, but this is another moment of just like, uh, eh. Under care! The Matrix plus Silent Hill, but about lung fluid and really boring. I guess I didn't like this one at the time, even. Um, I barely remember this one. There's nurses who don't really have faces and maybe walk weird. And then there's, like, a tube coming out of a guy who is, like, the only person in the world uh, that, like, seems to be pumping the some fluid out of his lungs that is, like, revivifies the weird, rope, like, weird Silent Hill nurses. I think that's right. Never little, never grown. A robot a robot hates to know about death and doesn't re relearn once his mother dies. Yes, this is about a little robot who uh, cavorts around and I guess uh, his like caretaker is finally about to pass and apparently once every couple years or whatever the caretaker teaches this little robot about death, and it has an existential crisis and and asks to be rebooted before that knowledge happened. Uh, so it always thinks it's like two years old, or it's only been on this planet for two years, when in fact it has been 60 or whatever. Uh, and then the human dies, and it chooses to reset itself again, I think? That's probably what happens. Solution. A father of two horrible boys decides to become the devil and, on, and unleashes a zombie apocalypse. I have the vaguest memory of this one. Um, I think the phrasing horrible boys specifically comes from the story, um, and it's like a letter sort of thing. Obviously did not leave a huge impression. And that's the last one. Okay. Um, I have good night sleep tight themes. How am I doing this for half an hour? Um, liminal spaces slash portal fantasies. I guess when I was in initially in my head, the portal fantasies was being wrapped up in the more liminal space kind of things. Um, so that would include things like under care, where you don't go through a door, but you're in a in a sort of hospital with no memory of a past. You know that sort of vibe. I think that's the non-robot stories largely probably get wrapped up in the sort of liminal space that is sometimes activated in the same way as a portal fantasy. Um, which, I liked liminal spaces 20 years ago, I guess. Um, there's a lot, yeah, um, a lot of thematic work around parent-child or nuclear family relations um, and deaths therein. Um, the Night Archer, obviously, a dying mother. Um, uh, mother, uh, the robot one, well, both of the robot ones, mother and um, never, little, never grown, involve sort of the fear of death of the parental figure and the reconfiguration of the family in that way. 
um, the, the first story, the sequence, um, is, is starts off with a description, basically, of the, the catatonic grandfather and how he's, like, a source of dread, but also maybe the beginnings of a way to find another world. All these things are happening. Um, selfhood into eternity is another uh, thing I wrote down. Um, this is like an ever little, never grown. The question of if your eternal can knowing death exists coincide with what you're doing. This is the the annex, right? The story of um, a robot consciousness, an AI that uh, you know sends itself off to have uh, individual experiences to improve itself and then return to itself every few hundred years. Um, this is also the question of the starship things, right? It's um, usually because they have robots that are dealing with this directly, but it's also the question of, like, you know, cryosleep. How long does one extend a human life to do a thing? Um, and there's a lot of twinning. Um, I, I've read a lot of uh, twinned things <laughs> recently, <laughs> from Septology to, the, to Doppelganger to this. Uh, to probably some other stuff I'm not recalling off the top of my head. Um, yeah, and then my last note is Victorian ghost stories slash Bradbury-esque sci-fi. Uh, love one of those things, hate one of the, hate the other. I think the one that Brian Evanson, at least in this collection, Good Night Sleep Tight, did well is the one I hate, and I think the one he did not great is the one I love, and that, to me, is a mid-ass book. Thanks for not watching.